Okay, now we'll talk about the center drop-down menu, which is Configure. Now, Configure has um, uh, five different options here in the menu, but this uh, sort of begins this uh, the uh, common theme to the DS7 software, where we uh, where it, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to run the test, how to how to perform. Uh, how to do everything on here. It's a step-by-step -step organized software. Really guides you through. So um, the configure menu is essentially the beginning portion of that. So the very top one is the system settings. This is the entire system itself. And you just work your way from the top to bottom in this list, same as you would do throughout the test. So the first thing is the system settings. And this, uh, this is the area where you can change language, which it only has English right now. Uh, the units of measurement is right now in SI units. It also has metric and imperial. Uh, you can choose whatever, the, whichever one you, you want to choose, uh, except for the fact that we have to keep it in SI units while we input or, or deal with any of the calibration portion. Because the software itself is designed and, and, uh, and the code is written all in SI units. So any raw data files, anything like that you would have, in SI units. But the user interface and the analysis and the reports are all in whatever measure of units of measure that you choose here. So you never see it SI units if you're in a period. But the background is always in SI units. It's just something to stay, they decided to stay every, make everything consistent in the background so they know that they don't have any mistakes and then they convert everything depending on how they, which, which one the user chooses. Okay. We're going to keep it in SI because we're going to talk about the calibration here in a minute. Uh, the date format is just British or American. Uh, here we have, a start, we have something called the countdown for the start stage in seconds. And you can turn on or off. What this does is it gives the ADU provides beeps, uh, loud noise uh, beeps, to give you time that when you push a, a start button on the screen, it gives you that amount of time to walk over and actually perform the task it's asking you to perform, whether it be open this valve or uh, uh, lower the weight onto a sample for the consolidation or direct shear, uh, whatever the task is, obviously you'll know what you're doing at the time, it'll tell you, but it gives you time to walk over and perform that task, okay? Uh, the default is five seconds. You can have this up to 20 seconds. If you, for instance, if you were to have the ADU here, but you were to have long cables, to a, uh, a direct shear machine on the op opposite side of the room, you could set that for 10 seconds and take your 10 seconds, walk over, and then you will hear a double beep from the ADU, and that gives that tells you that it, we're at zero. You can begin whatever task that it, you're asked to perform. Okay, um, that's up to you. You can turn it off altogether if you want. Uh, everything is very close to the ADU. It's up. It's it's really the user's choice. Uh, the one on the right here is if you have communication errors or communication issues, you can change which port uh, uh, on the computer that the ADU is connected into. You can also write a log port, uh, a log for the communication port between the ADU and the, and the software itself. That's used for troubleshooting if necessary. So I'll click OK. We'll just keep it as is. Go back to configure. We've already, that was system settings. The next one we'll look at is transducers. Now this is the area or the screen where we input all of the calibration data or we actually calibrate a transducer in this screen as well. Now I've already inputted the calibration data for the six transducers that we have plugged in for triaxial testing. But I can show you how to do it. Uh, first, the first thing we have to do is select the proper logger channel that the transducer is connected to. For instance, we have uh, 16 channels uh, in this ADU, the first bank of 8, and the second bank of 8 is 9 through 16. And um, <coughs> for instance, we'll talk about what's plugged into channel 1, which is this transducer right here. This transducer is the axial strain transducer on the load frame itself. So I have, in the drop down of the arrow, I have what channel logger we want to look at. We want channel 1. Here, uh, I entered the serial number off of the transducer itself, and I also verified that the transducer serial number matches what the serial number is on the 
uh, calibration sheet that ELE sends out with the transducer itself. Okay, this is the this is a one version of the calibration sheets that are sent with each transducer. Okay, and if you notice, I wrote on the top triaxial axial displacement channel number one. So I've also written on here where that transducer should be plugged into for the ADU. Okay. And then if you notice, I verified the serial number on the screen with the serial number on this sheet and the serial number on the transducer device itself. So we know that this sheet goes with that transducer and everything is tied in together into the software itself and saved onto a file. Okay? The next, I choose which transducer type through the drop-down menu. If you notice here, this is, these are your choices. Uh, the very top one is a vertical or horizontal displacement. That is, uh, that is going to be used for any horizontal or vertical displacement transducers, small 10 millimeter transducers that are uh, used for direct shear. Or it'll also be the one used for any type of one dimensional consolidation. The next one down is the axial displacement. That is the similar to what we have here, 50 millimeter uh, LVDTs used for triaxial testing, CBR testing, uh, for displacement or axial strain. Then you have two options for our pressure transducers. The ones that we have here, the three that we have, are the pressure transducer 1700. The 1000 or 1700 is the amount of kilopascals capacity or range of each transducer. These are 1700 kPa range transducers. The fifth one down is force. Force is used for any sort of um, S-type load cell, <clears throat> um, submersible load transducers, or what we used to have uh, uh, a force monitoring uh, LVDTs on the backside of load rings, which I don't think ELE provides any longer. But that's what we'd use for force. The one beneath that is the volume change unit, which we've talked about. That's the, the volume change transducer that's hanging on the wall. And the last one is not assigned, which would be there as a default. Okay. This one we've already talked about is the axial displacement. And then uh, we go to step three, which is, uh, step three is where we actually enter or calibrate the transducer itself. We, can ha we have that option. Because these transducers are new out of the box, they've been calibrated at the factory and are provided with calibration sheets, which I've already shown you. Uh, so we'll, we'll hit the button called enter cal data. It'll bring up a new screen where we need three pieces of information all provided on this calibration sheet, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, so the three pieces of information are the gain, the slope, or the constant factor, and the maximum range of that transducer. That information is provided on here. The gain is provided here on this sheet under figures for use with DS6 or figures for use with DS7. Now, the software itself is a DS7. The, an earlier version is DS6. For this information, we're going to use for DS6. And all that is is DS7 has the capability that when you calibrate to have five different slopes. Or it doesn't have to be completely linear of one slope. But you can have five different slopes depending on the range of the transducer or throughout the range of the transducer. But for DS6, what we've done is average this range into one slope. And that's what you, you input into this. So you have a gain. You have a slope or constant factor. And then what you have is a range. Now the range that it requires in this screen is the maximum range that it has on the screen that it was tested to, or on the sheet that it was tested to. For instance, this axial displacement transducer was tested to 50 millimeters, and it has a 50 millimeter range. So that's the three pieces of information you'll input into the screen. And the actual, the actual range of that transducer is about 52 millimeters but 50 is what we've calibrated it to, and it just has a little extra in the piston. Okay. Now, um, if we didn't have this information, or for instance, say a year from now, which ASTM requires yearly calibration, a year from now, <clears throat> you would want to recalibrate or verify that transducer. In order to do that, uh, well, I'm sorry, first we click OK, and now, it, what, it, what the software did, before we get to that, what the software did is calculated the bit, the min and max bit values, or bit numbers, uh, depending on the range, using the slope and, and gain. And it filled in the five slopes with the one slope. 
and the number of bit readings, which is not really relevant to the user itself. It, just, it automatically does this. The last, the last box here is the polarity, which is box four here. And that polarity, can, you can immediately go from negative to positive polarity. For instance, if the slope was negative and you pushed up on that piston, uh, it would read negative going in. Slope is positive, it would read positive going in. And in this case, we want positive to be going in because the piston moves up to monitor the amount of strain in the sample. So we're going to keep it positive and all the slopes are positive. We can verify that that's correct. And then we hit apply, which is the apply button beneath the serial number. And what that does is bring all the data down into this bottom portion into memory. Okay? And if you notice logger channel one, the serial number, the type of transducer, the gain, and the five slopes are all listed here. And if you notice also, channel one through six are all listed individually for the six transducers that we have connected to the ADU right now. Okay? Um, one more thing, to calibrate the transducer, instead you would hit calibrate transducer, and it takes you to the gain calibration, <coughs> which I won't do, but it's very simple to do. Um, if you have the capability to calibrate a transducer, which means you would have either slip gauges or some sort of device that's traceable that you can measure the, the amount of uh, deformation of that transducer, uh, you could go ahead and calibrate this and you can calibrate it up to five different slopes or, or between min and maximum up to four different locations between minimum and maximum. It's very easy. Just follow the instructions step by step through the screens and you can, you can have a transducer calibrated uh, within, within a minute. Okay. Well, obviously, we won't do that here because we've, we have the calibration information, but say in a year from now, you'd want to calibrate it using that feature. Okay. Um, the last thing we want to do here is show that we have, um, we have all of the transducers uh, calibration information in. You notice that you have the, uh, channels one through six. You have serial numbers, the type of transducers, which are quite different, the gains and the slopes. And then seven and eight, you have not assigned, not assigned, and zeros. And if you notice, there's no, there are no transducers plugged into seven or eight. And if you want to look at this bank of transducers, you just click on the channel set here on the left, nine through 16. If you notice, we have nothing in there yet. We will, but we have nothing inputted in there as well. And you can go all the way up to the channel set here. Okay. Now to get out of this screen, let's go ahead and verify that that transducer is reading appropriately to what we want. So you click OK at the bottom, it takes us back to the main menu, and then we go back to configure, and we drop down to the third one in the drop, the third option in the drop down menu, which is monitor transducer. That takes us to a monitor live transducer screen. <coughs> what this screen is, it allows us to see what the transducer is reading at all times any transducer at all times. Okay. So uh, you have a big white screen here with nothing on it right now, but on the right side, this is where we decide which transducer we want to look at. So at the top here, we have logger channel. Just go down to the menu, to logger channel one, and we have the option, uh, the button to display transducer, and it automatically brings that transducer up into the left, uh, left menu here. And so you've, you have on the far left, you have the logger channel, the type, of the type of transducer, and then you have the actual live reading of that transducer on the screen itself in millimeters. Okay. Um, you can also reset the transducer. If it was, say, 0.1 or 1.1 millimeters, you could reset it. It'll ask you, are you sure you want to do it? Click OK, and it'll take it back to zero, whatever location that is. And then what we can do now is come over here and push the piston of the transducer up and read the screen to verify A, that we have the appropriate polarity of the transducer. We went up being positive, which it is. And also we can, if we wanted to, we can put some slip gauges or something underneath to verify that it's reading accurately. Now, um, I mentioned before that it gives about 52 millimeters and it's reading 52.2 millimeters, which is very accurate, okay? Now, I want you to notice too that I went, I, I pushed the piston up very slowly. 
And remember I talked on the ADU, when I talked about the ADU of an error light. Now if I push this piston up very, very quickly, notice on the ADU the red LED comes on for error, which is the second one from the top. And also notice on the screen, at the very top, you'll see the time and you'll see over range channel, channel one and the date. Okay? Now what that does is that tells us that we've bumped the transducer, it's read over its range, and we've got a problem, we have an error. Now what I can do is either reset the transducer on the screen, or I can, I've, I've corrected it now so it's, it's stopped. But that gives you an, an error message or gives you some information, something is wrong with the transducer. One more time to get that correct. Okay, oh you just want me to do it again? Yeah, yeah. Get the red. There's the LED. Yeah. Red air light on. Okay. Good. Okay, now what we can do on the screen here is we can say, okay, instead of just looking uh, to eliminate that, we can clear the transducer list, which eliminates that. And we can look at the range. I have one through six, and I can do I can hit the display range button. And that allows me to monitor all six transducers that I have connected in right now. Okay. And now the volume change unit is reading 8.6 milliliters. And I want to I want to go ahead and zero that. Are you sure? And now it's back down to zero milliliters. Okay. And if I wanted to, I can go ahead and, uh, for instance, um, uh, the pressure, I can, I can supply pressure to these to make sure they're reading appropriately. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll come over here. We'll open up the cell pressure. Say again to 10 PSI. Put the switch to pressure. Supplies 10 PSI pressure in. Out through the tube, over, through this tube, to this pressure transducer right here, and the valve is stopped or it would come out of this hole here. And now this pressure transducer is connected in here, and right now it should be reading about 10 PSI. Well, it's not, it's reading in kPa, and it's reading just under 70 kPa, which is right around, it, it's about a 7 to 1, 7.1 to 1 ratio, which is very good, quite accurate. Now, I will mention this, that it's reading a little under what it should be reading <clears throat> as compared to what it's reading on that screen. If you were to do a complete conversion from 10 PSI to KPA, it's about 7.2 or 7.3. The reason this is lower is because you have tubing expansion here and you have different points of reading. 10 PSI is reading right behind the regulator but then you have that, that pressure going all the way through the water, through the burette, through the tubing in the back, through the long tubing in the front, all the way out to the transducer reading here. Now, the sample is going to be here. The sample is not going to be the back side of that panel. So accuracy here is taken into play, er, er, into play here and it is much more accurate to be reading the pressure at the moment of impact with the soil rather than over here in the panel. And that's the advantage of having the transducers right here at the cell itself, rather than just utilizing that transducer there, okay? But we, we can also verify too that that's reading positively, so the polarity is correct. Uh, we want obviously to read positive pressures. 